So we have defined Fourier transform, but why do we want to do that? We know for an LTI system, you have the impulse response, and for an arbitrary input, you can convolve with the impulse response and you get the output. That's fine. That's no problem. But why do we want to bother with the Fourier transform? One very very important reason is the convolution property that we are going to state next. When we have the convolution of x and h equal to y in the time domain, now we apply Fourier transform on y to get big Y. Then it's related to x and h in a very small simple manner. It's simply the product of the two. So convolution in the time domain has become product in the frequency domain. And we know product is much, much more intuitive and much more easier to visualize. And one more reason is that when we look at application, in many cases, many signals possess property that can be exposed better in the frequency domain. It's hard to detect these property in the time domain, but it's very easy to see it, to visualize it in the frequency domain. The proof is very similar to the continuous time case. First, we have e at y e j omega by definition like this. Plug in the relation that y n is the convolution of x and k. Then we have this double summation here. When we have two summation, sum over n, sum over k, it's usually a good idea to. Switch the order, so we have summation over k first, and then summation over n. Then we can see that this x k does not depend on n, so we can pull it out, and uh, the remaining term h n minus k and uh, e minus j omega n. It's a little bit similar to frequency response, doesn't it? But、uh, still a little bit different. To make it like the frequency response, we add another term, n minus k here. So this is n minus k, and this is also n minus k. So now we have an extra term, e minus j omega k here, because here we added plus j omega k. So now we subtract e minus j omega k. Now the second summation is. Just like the frequency response, let's、uh, make the change of variable m equal to m minus k. Then this becomes m. It becomes m. And as n goes from minus infinity to infinity, m will also go from minus infinity to infinity. Now we recognize that this one is the Fourier transform. Is the Fourier transform of the sequence h? So it's the frequency response of the system. And this one. It's the spectrum of x. So this is x e j omega, and this is h e j omega. Voila, done. The discrete time Fourier transform has many useful properties, very similar to the continuous time Fourier transform. Even the proofs are very similar. We will go through some of them here. You can find more in the textbook. Section two point eight and section two point nine. Linearity. If we have two sequences x whose Fourier transform is big X and sequence y whose Fourier transform is big Y, when we take the linear combination of x and y in the time domain, its Fourier transform is simply the linear combination of x and y with the same linear combination coefficients. Flipping. When we flip a sequence x, flip it to y, then here's how y, the Fourier transform of sequence y and、uh, x is related, and the Fourier transform of x is related. The proof is very straightforward. By definition, the Fourier transform of y. Is y e minus j omega n, and here we put x minus n because that's what y n is. If we look at this expression, this is the Fourier transform of x, 
But now there's an extra minus, so it's x e minus j omega. Very similarly, we can show the conjugate property when we have a y that is the conjugate of x. Then the Fourier transform of y is related to the Fourier transform of x, like so. Conjugate and then e minus j omega. The proof is very similar to flipping property. It's a straightforward substitution. How about the case that we have flipping and conjugate combined? In this case, the Fourier transform is simply the conjugate of Fourier transform of x. We would leave this as an exercise. Product. If we have a sequence that is the product of x and y, then the Fourier transform w is given in this form. x e j theta, y e j omega minus theta, d theta over 2 pi, and the integrals from 0 to 2 pi. We can prove this by applying inverse Fourier transform on w and see if the sequence that we get in the time domain is indeed the product of x and y. Okay, so we plug in w here, this expression here, then this is w in the bracket, we have ej omega n. Now we have two integral, 1 over theta and 1 of omega. We can switch the order of these two integral. Let's first, now let's have theta first, 0 to 2 pi, and then another one is 0 to 2 pi, that this one is for omega. And let's have all the omega term here, omega minus theta, we have ej omega and then n. But then this is omega minus theta, so let's also have a minus a theta here to make it look like inverse Fourier transform. And this is d omega, right? And now we still have x ej theta here x ej theta it does not depend on omega so let me pull out ej theta x ej theta because there is an extra term here so let me compensate the extra term by adding ej theta n okay this d omega over 2 pi and also d theta over 2 pi if we look at this term here we see that it's the Fourier transform, the inverse Fourier transform of y. So what we get is yn here. And this term does not depend on theta at all. So we can pull it out. It is yn and the integral 0 to 2 pi x ej theta and ej theta n d theta over 2 pi. Now we see what is this? This is the inverse Fourier transform of x, so we get x. So indeed, this is the product of x and y. Similar to the continuous time Fourier transform, we have the possible relation. The energy of x in the time domain, which is x absolute value squared sum over all n, is equal to the energy of x in the frequency domain over one period. Remember the Fourier transform is periodic with a period 2 pi. We can compare it with the continuous time case. Continuous time possible possible relation states that the energy in the time domain is the same as the energy in the frequency domain. Here the integral goes from minus infinity to infinity. To prove the relation, let's first observe that this is actually the product of x and the conjugate of x. Product. Remember we just talked about the product property? Very tempting to use the product property. Let's define w 
that is the product of x and the conjugate of x. And to recall that if we have the conjugate of x, its a Fourier transform is equal to xej minus omega and then conjugate. Another useful thing that we may want to use is that when we sum over all sample of w, this is equal to the Fourier transform of w evaluated at omega equal to zero. Using these three properties, we should be able to prove the possible relation. We will leave this as an exercise. Now let's talk about two useful shifting properties. One is time shifting and the other one is frequency shifting. When we have y, that is a shift of x in the time domain, the Fourier transform of y is related to the Fourier transform of x like this. It has an extra term e minus j at 0 omega, a um, exponential function of omega. This means that if we shift in the frequent time domain, it introduces only a phase term in the frequency domain. This is very similar to the continuous time Fourier transform when we introduce a shift in the time domain, continuous time Fourier transform. Fourier transform of a continuous time signal, x, a, the Fourier transform is multiplied by this exponential function, an exponential function of omega. The proof is a straightforward substitution. The Fourier transform of y can be obtained by applying Fourier transform on the sequence yn. And the sequence yn now is x, m minus n0 summation over n. And this doesn't look like Fourier transform, so let's try to make it more like a Fourier transform. So this is xm minus n0, so let's try to put n minus n0 here as well. Now we have an extra exponential term, so let's compensate that here. Minus j omega n0, alright, summation over n. Now by a substitute, by a change of variable, k equal to m minus n0, then we get e minus j omega n0, summation over k, and this is xk e minus j omega k, and k also goes from in minus infinity to infinity, and we see that what is this? This is the free transform of x. So, done. Frequency shifting property. If we have x, sequence x, whose free transform is a big x. Now, if we shift x by omega 0, and this is y, x e to omega, correspondingly, the time domain sequence y is related to the sequence x. Like this, it has an extra term, ej omega 0 n. So shifting in frequency domain. Now in frequency domain, introduces only a phase term in the time domain because this exponential function here, whose magnitude is 1, is only a phase term. This is very similar to the continuous time Fourier transform case where we shift the Fourier transform by omega 0. In the time domain, we get an extra phase term, ej omega 0 t, an exponential function of t with a frequency omega 0. We prove this, let's first write down the free transform of x. That's what it is. Now let's shift x. ej, we want to shift it, right? So, equal to n, x n, e minus j n. So, in the place of omega 0, Let's put omega minus omega 0 and omega minus omega 0. The exponential function here can be split into two terms. One is e, j, and omega 0. And the other one is e minus j and omega. And this looks very much like Fourier transform. So which sequence are we taking Fourier transform for? It's this sequence, the sequence in the red bracket. 
So the sequence in the red bracket is our yn, which is equal to xn with multiplied by an exponential sequence with the frequency omega zero. Question. Suppose this is what x e j omega look like in the frequency domain. Zero, like this, and pi, and then around two pi, so like this. How should we plot y? Plot y, that is the shift of x e j omega by omega zero. When omega zero is equal to, for example, pi over four, or pi. We will leave this as an exercise. Another question. Suppose we have y that is actually the average of two shift omega. This is the same as before. And there's another term, ej omega plus omega zero. Then what would be the corresponding time domain sequence yn? 